Hello again everybody, Phil Liggett here and glad to be along with you once more and this Tony Rominger contemplating one place better in the 80th running of Liège Baston Liège perhaps than last year when he was second to Rolf Sorensen. This great event brings together once again all of the best in world cycling, none better than the former world champion, Gianni Bugno, a rare smile from him, and not just because he won the Tour de Flanders recently, but also because the weather is so good down here. Franco Ballerini and Claudio Chiapucci, they really are all coming down into the Belgian Ardennes today because this for them is the big test, the chance to see just how the early season form is coming and for them it's a bit really is a start of the spring classic season there's andre schmil who won the paris roubaix one of the finest paris roubaix i've seen in years and being congratulated by his fellow competitors for that moreno argentin four times a winner of the liege baston liege 1985 through to 87 and indeed in 1991 and riding away there eric van lanker of word perfect and here for me one of the fine riders of the season johan museo not just a sprinter but a man who can go out there and ride the race from the front. Vyacheslav Yekimov of the Soviet Union. He's expected to lead the Word Perfect team in the upcoming Tour Dupont. Raoul Alcala now on a new team, having left Word Perfect. He's riding for Team Motorola. And as they roll out here, look down, you'll see the white jersey of the world champion from the United States, Lance Armstrong. And uh, indeed, a proliferation at the front there of the Gevice team in the blue jerseys. Well, as I say, this is the 80th running of Liège Baston Liège. It's a race of 268 and a half kilometres, or if we talk in miles, 168 miles. 25 teams on the start line, and officially there are 11 climbs on the course, but there are indeed 12. And I can tell you straight away that soon after the start today, around about the four kilometre mark, there was an attack by four riders. And there were Massimo Girotto from the ZG Mobili team, Roberto Torres from the Festina team, Francis Moreau from the GAN team, and Dante Rezzi from the Jolly team. Well, they've all been caught except two of them now, and Girotto is still out there along with Roberto Torres. It's been a long, long day for them in the saddle. They went clear on the Côte d'Ambourg soon after the start. They've had a maximum lead of 17 minutes, but now the chase down really is on in earnest. And the team doing most of the work is the Javais team. That's the latest time gap, 5 minutes and 30 seconds. Two survivors out there, Torres and Girotto. Well, Girotto is one of the grand old men of world cycling. He's won stages in the Tour de France. And is a strong rider to go out in front. There you can see the weather is threatening rain. We haven't had any. It's just about... 48 degrees Fahrenheit and uh, a 25 mile an hour's wind coming across from the northeast. But the conditions really are much, much better than we normally have in this time of the year, April down in the Belgian Ardennes. If any of you ever get the chance to go cycling down here, I can tell you it's the most beautiful country. And it's not the flat roads of Flanders now with the cobblestones, but the narrow twisting roads that duck and dive through the fir trees where there are, in fact, a lot of wild animals roam around in the woods. It's a beautiful place to be. Even nicer today, with the sun out, 95 kilometres still to race, so that's just under 60 miles left to go. We're heading into Wanner, and there you can see the majority of the main field. We race down to Liège, but it's once you make that turn at Bastogne from the, the start at Liège that the racing really does get underway, and quite often you get scenes of early attacks. There's the last few years of victory, Sean Kelly winning in 1984, same year that Greg LeMond finished third and the best American player position so far in Liège, Bastogne Liège. Kelly won again in 1989. Last year it was Rolf Sorensen, and sadly Sorensen not here having crashed and broken his wrist, and he's really going to have to get himself back into shape now for the big rise to come. Stocker, and this is a short but very steep little climb, and through the village here as Stavlo, which is a very attractive little village, bypassed now by a bigger road, and has made the village a really nice place to be. Narrow road, some of them cobbled, and the chase down continues. And it looks as though we might have Dirk de Wolf Previous winner of this race, setting the tempo on the front. And what a tempo it is, too. Little Tony Rominger on the left of our picture, sitting in his saddle, keeping the cadence going well. Now he's out of the saddle to keep up with the pace. Make look at Lance Armstrong, too, riding right at the front. Armstrong's been a little unhappy with his form so far. But Motorola tipping the wing today, saying he's going well again before the start. He missed out on 
Paris Roubaix, and I expect he was pretty happy about that when he saw the conditions of the day. But Rominger now setting the pace. A little bit of a surprise so early on in the course here. As Rominger rides strongly up the front and quite clearly Armstrong has decided to mark Tony Rominger, who's made no secret about the fact he wants to win this race. Rominger too has been away training in preparation. And Armstrong firmly latched onto his back wheel. What a marvellous little climber Tony Rominger is when he's like this. We saw him dance over the Alps and really cause some pain to Miguel Indurain last year. He won both of those Alpine stages of the Tour de France. But he couldn't shake off Indurain. But I wonder, you know, whether in fact he will be an even bigger challenge this year in the Tour de France. Number two in the world. And uh, the man who's number one is, of course, Miguel Indurain. But this little breakaway beginning to establish now. And Rominger is the rider setting the pace. So this is the climb of the Stocker Wall. And we're leaving the town of Stablo. And Rominger here is accelerating. And, you know, I think it's Furman who's come alongside him, the Javice rider. Giorgio Ferlan, a rider who won Milan San Remo and has been virtually in hiding as far as the international scene goes ever since, but openly declaring he wanted to do a ride in Liège, Baston Liège. He didn't feel as though the other classics in between suited him, the Tour of Flanders and the Paris Roubaix, but he very much has always said he was coming back for Liège, Baston Liège. This is the oldest professional classic on the calendar, starting in the very early 1890s, 1891. And a little breakaway beginning to establish itself nicely here. And it's gone extremely early under the impetus of Tony Rominger. And the white jersey coming across, I'm sure, is Lance Armstrong. He's read the move well. Still very conscious of the fact he is the world champion and no victories yet since he won the world title in Oslo, Norway last year. And that, you know, isn't uh, is usually the case with world champions. They don't seem to ride well once they pull on the rainbow jersey. 2.10, that gap has completely crumbled now. Torres and Girotto will be with us very shortly. I think we can rely on that. And Rominger really has decided to split the field on this climb. We're on the cobblestones now. And Rominger looking for no assistance at all here in Stavlo for anybody to come up and help him out. He's quite happy to continue. Doku is the climb in which he made his move. And there's Armstrong. Armstrong is going really exceptionally well now. And the leader of the World Cup competition wearing the jersey there. This is Claudio Chiaputti. The other one was Andre Schmil, winner of Paris Roubaix. Now the new leader of the World Cup. This breakaway beginning to establish itself. Ferland is here. Chiaputti. La Haute Leve. Now the little coats come thick and fast. They're short and very sharp, and on occasion very steep. And the riders here really have begun to attack very early on. It's Evgeny Berzan who's gone up alongside Claudio Chiaputti. Now it's Armstrong's turn to follow the wheel through as Schmil drops through on the inside. These riders are working very well together to establish the gap. And the motorcycles are being allowed in, but uh, only to get out of the way, I think, because there's a group coming up very quickly. But look in the far distance there, and there's no sign of the main field at all. This looks as though we're going to see an early selection of some very strong men indeed. And the MG rider coming right up, it looked to me as though it was Maximilian Chiandri. Number 41 was Moreno Argentine. So the man of the Belgian classics is here again. And still to come is Flesh Wallon. And he'll be riding that as well. And he's always excelled in what used to be the Ardenne weekend. They used to hold the two big races on Saturday and Sunday, and that was quite a tall order. And Kiapucci bridging the gap very quickly because the pressure is still being applied, I think now by Evgeny Berza. But they're trying rapidly to keep this breakaway going very strongly indeed. It was all started by Rominger, 
who at the moment is the middle of these three riders and content now to see the rest of the riders put their ten penny worth in and consolidate this breakaway. Good to see that Kia Pucci has found himself a little bit of early season form. There's the composition of the breakaway, and Della Santa is the other rider I haven't yet mentioned who's come up. Number 14. Well, they're leaving themselves the best part of 55 miles to survive this, and Rominger is just having none of it. He's even going faster now. Armstrong marking the move well. The only Motorola rider that we've seen come to the front of this group. He's watched the moves, he's followed Rominger. We're on the way back up to Liège, and then the suburb. This is Edric van Hooyerdonk here. Now, he must be at the head of what is the remnants of the peloton just at the moment. Word Perfect really could do with a good result right now. They're not having a great start to the season. And Van Hooyerdonk is trying to bridge the gap. He's recognised that the train is departing from this particular station because the Mavic team car has now been called in, which gives us at least a 30-second advantage. And Van Hooyerdonk is going to have to work hard to get across. The vice team well represented here. A lot of anxious faces turning over to just to see what sort of a gap they're getting. Well, we can find out now. 15 seconds of Van Hooydonk. And Schmil has let this group go because he's gone back to lead the chase at 40 seconds. So he was dropped on the climb here of La Haute Levee. And, you know, he might well be feeling the effects of that race just one week ago. It takes a little while to recover from the pounding of the Pave of the Hell of the North. But when you pulled on the, for the first time indeed, the leader's jersey of the World Cup Series, he's made his effort to stay with the men, and at the moment, he's dropped back to a second group on the road. This is a wonderful cause for the attacking rider. The roads are narrow, it twists and turns, you're always out of sight once you've got about half a minute. On to the Côte du Rocher. Four-kilometer climb, which is a fair... A fair climb, this one, but it's not as steep as the regular ones. And Della Santa, Stefano Della Santa, sitting near the back here. Valuable teammate to have along for Tony Rominger. And he's also having what is for him a great start to the season. Won the overall classification of the Ruta del Sol, and also he finished a stage winner and overall winner of the Catalan week as well. So he's had five wins already. And he's a rider who will be a valuable ally to Rominger. Lance Armstrong is going to feel a little bit alone out here and looking very, very prominent in the World Championship jersey. Well, I have to say right now, he really does look good and strong. The fairy tale has sent to the top of world cycling this man has made from an ex-top triathlete. He's broken in in a big way in just two seasons. Marino Argentin, the man of the Ardennes. What a lovely rider he is, but he's searching for some form right now. And all of the team cars are still not here, which indicates our gap is no more than 30 seconds. Let's have a look out to the right of the helicopter, see if that group will. Van Hooydonk appears to have gone back, and he's gone back in a big way. This is a big gap now. It's got to be up to 50 seconds. Over the years, there have been some terrible weather conditions, especially the year that Bernard Eno won this race, when only a handful of riders finished the course, and indeed it's 55 seconds to the Schmil group, and the main field are losing ground. And I think they'll lose a little bit of their impetus too, because the teams that wanted their men away, I think have got their men away. The big name that's missing is Gianni Bugno, and the Palti team. And Andre Schmil is settled down in the second group on the road. He may recover.
Armstrong setting the pace now, looking for a little bit of help. Oh, in fact, this is the chase group because Schmil is in there and it's the white jersey of Schmil, second from the back of the line. Kengi Alta's here and Pensek, little Frenchman who at one time showed great ability and we thought would win in the Tour de France, but it never came well for him in the end. And there is the other group. So they really have that attack by Tony Rominger has blown this main field totally apart. The Lotto team, Peter Fallazain is one of the riders down there for Lotto. Let's go back down and join the leaders here. Claudio Chiapucci, nice to see. The man is making an early return to top form. Turned professional back in 1985, Claudio Chiapucci, you know, but he never really impressed anybody until 1989. That marvellous breakaway in the Tour de France. He didn't win a race, in fact, for the first four years of his career. There was no indication that this man was going to rise to the very pinnacle of world cycling, but... As a commentator, I can tell you I'm happy he did because he seems to disregard real tactics and just has a go, and the crowd love him for it. But he's in the breakaway today. Maybe he'll get a good result here. As Armstrong again marks Tony Rominger, I think it is, who's opened up a little gap, but they don't want to go clear. Armstrong feeling it's too early to take up the chase and start to work here with the leader. Much too far to go. Well, I think Armstrong really is uh, feeling his strength today and he's feeling good. And look at that, 24th in the world ranked of cycling at the moment and that despite only his second full year as a professional. Without putting too fine a point on it, well, many people often ask me how one visits the toilet on the road. Well, if you don't like it, you best turn away now. And the field is regrouped at the front. That breakaway going clear all the time. Argentin brings the line through, keeps the pressure high. And now just behind him is Berza. This is a very, very strong breakaway. Gavais have three men up here, and that could cause problems. If you've seen the, the way the teams can work, and with three men in this breakaway, Rominger will have noted it for sure. Armstrong must feel a little bit overawed by the presence of these teams. He's really going to have to work out how he can get rid of any of them if he can win. If it came down to a sprint finish, of course, I would put my money on Armstrong right now. He's a very good sprinter. But Liege, Baston Liege now finishes on top of a climb, and that might throw the advantage another way. Three climbs still to come before the finish. Stunning little villages in the Ardennes. Number 45 here at the back of the field. And just keeping the pace nicely uh, together. This is the chase group here, and nobody, although the faces are serious enough, that's Pensek. There's Andre Schmil. And these riders are just trying to get on terms, but they're still losing ground, in fact. And they're not anywhere like getting on terms just now. And the big team that's missing in both of the groups is the Palti team. Haven't got a rider up here at all. And there is Johan Museu as we go back up to the leader. And this is the world champion having a chat now with his team car to find out what is the composition of that chase group. And uh, really, if Lance is careful, I would spend a little less time now working to consolidate the breakaway, a little bit more time, leaving it to the others to do the work. He can afford to do that legitimately as the only Motorola rider in the breakaway. And as you can see now, the Romulo group pulling well clear with Armstrong. Almost two minutes the gap. Armstrong still willing to keep it going. And 
looks like an interview going out there from the Carrera team car directly onto Belgian television pictures. Cote de la Redoute, five kilometers or three miles to the top. This is an absolute brute. Has often been the springboard for the riders when they jump away to victory. These are the five, six leaders now of the 80th Liège Baston Liège. The Laladuc climb starts when you climb away from the village of Remouchon. It's short and very steep, it's one in five. And they're always a nice crowd here, and today especially because the sun has now come out even more. And the favourite sitting here at the back. The favourite indeed, the man who forced the attack that wiped out the breakaways. And now Tony Rominger has got one or two other problems on his mind. I don't think that Moreno Argentine has the strength to cope with Rominger yet. No indication of that. In fact, as I speak, Argentine has been slipped away from this group back to 45 seconds. I didn't see him go. And Schmill is closed in a little bit with his group at 132. But they're now preparing for the climb of Laradut. It starts gently, but it soon kicks. You climb up past the main motorway to Mons, which runs on their right shoulder. And then it goes into very narrow roads, and there are always thousands of spectators up there to shout the riders over the top. Then they plunge down narrow lanes and eventually make their way up to the next big climb, which is the Côte des Forges, and which in the past I've seen Pedro Delgado try to shake off riders like Sean Kelly without success. The sort of area where they must try and rid themselves of a man like Lance Armstrong, but Lance, you know, although he may not be seen as a great mountain climber, He's such a strong rider, he can ride these small hills and ride them well. To the credit of everybody in this breakaway, they are working together. Argentina has gone now, that's good news for Rominger and for Armstrong too, of course. But still here is Ferlan and Berzin, two riders on the Gavais team. Rominger is here for Mapei with De La Santa and Armstrong and Chiapucci. Rominger goes through, where's number 11? This is the turn now over a small, small stretch of cobblestones here. Usually on the day before Liège Baston Liège, they have a criterium over these cobblestones for amateur riders in the town of Remouchon. It really is a holiday town. There isn't a lot of industry at all down here. A very pretty town. The riders will now peel off to their right into a narrow back street which leads to Laradute. And actually, the climb itself, there's a small sign which takes you up it if you're ever down here on your bike. You can't get lost. They'll guide you up Laradute. And then you'll need a fairly low gear to get up, normally around about 39, 26 or 27 if you're not a top-class racing cyclist. These riders will probably use 23 or 24 back sprockets. It's steep. Just the sort of climb to suit Tony Rominger and Claudio Chiapucci. And quite clearly Armstrong not afraid of what's to come. Straight up there at the front. These are the turns now around the back streets as we make our way up to the climb. We'll go under a railway bridge, I think it is, just before we start the climb. And it's a straight road for a while as you climb above the motorway, the auto route on the right-hand side. And if, if tradition prevails, we'll see all the cars stopped, which as you probably know is totally against the law, but I'm afraid you can't stop the spectators doing it. This is cycling mad Belgium, and I'm quite sure we'll see the cars just simply stopped to watch the passage on the lower road of the 80th Liège Baston Liège. Little Tony Rominger dancing on the pedals, Armstrong in second place. Claudio Chiapucci seems content to ride last man at the moment. Maybe, of course, he wants to feel the pressure and see what's going on with the strong riders in this group. He may not be that confident he's got the form for the last couple of climbs in this race.
there's the right turn as we go under the bridge. It's the road bridge, and look at the cars, the way they're parked. You think it was a Le Mans-type road racing start for the cars there? They've completely blocked up the auto route as the race goes through on the inside road. Very narrow road, but very good service at this point. Maybe the camera from this angle will give you some idea as we climb up the hill. Now, surely Rominger will try to attack on this climb, but I don't really know why he's setting the pace, maybe to keep it very high, but I would have thought he'd have been a little bit better to have come from three or four men down and accelerated sharply to try and hurt the riders in this group. Ferlan and Berzin are sitting very near the front and watching him. And you can hear the cry there for Ali Tony. Very popular figure here. It's because of Romiga. He gave we had such a great Tour de France last year because he was attacking all of the time, although he lost so much time with bad luck and penalties early on in the Tour de France. He lost all hope of victory before we got to the mountains, his favourite domain. Only 12% at the moment, Lara Dute. Pucci dodging around with the wheels at the back, third overall in the Tour of the Pays Basque in Spain this year, but no other real result to his name. The big boys like, like their form to creep gently in through these spring classics so that when they come out for the races they consider their main targets, the Tours of Spain, Italy and France, the form is there. It's a long season. 19%. We're getting a little bit steeper now. This is the one in five section. Keir Pucci just sitting down in the saddle. Rominger setting the pace, but I'm afraid he's got for a shadow the two boys from Javis. Della Santa on the far left of our picture, and uh, I have to say that Armstrong riding this brilliantly, tucked right in nicely in the centre. Hear the cars behind blowing the hooters. This is to keep the crowd back now because they can, in fact, narrow this road down to just the width of a couple of cyclists. It's a very narrow climb. And Romiger setting a terrific pace up here, but he's hurting nobody. Although I suspect he's hurting them, he's not actually breaking their spirit at all. Ferlan and Berzan. Berzan, the rider, just in front here of Kiapucci. What a superb piece of riding, though, by, uh, by uh, Armstrong particularly, yes, but by the man at the front here, Tony Rominger. And in fact, uh, Kip puts in a little bit of trouble, but he's, he's going to be safe if he can just hang on a little bit longer because we flip over the top and go round to the left of the course there. And they have climbed this completely as a group, and I have to say I'm a little bit surprised. I really thought that Rominger might have tried here to have broken one or two of them. There's Bears at number 42. He's come to the back and right alongside Rominger now, just to remind him he's not feeling too bad, is Jojo Ferlin. Been a professional now. This is his fourth season as a pro, Ferlin. Started well in 1990 when he won the Italian national title. That was his only win of the year, by the way, and he was the champion of Italy. Don't forget, this was the sort of area when we started, the big Italian renaissance. And then he came good in 91. He only got one win, but we started to see he could ride the big races. He had a seventh place in the Tour of Switzerland, which many riders use as a warm-up race for the Tour de France. Top of the Côte de la Redoute. They'll be spinning for the prize at the top because there's a championship of the mountains. And uh, I wonder if Rominger is going to continue to push for that. The early breakaway wiped out quite a few of them, but not uh, before Rominger wiped them out on the climbs. Giorgio Ferland continues as a man who loves the classic season in Belgium. He finally got his victory in the Flesh Wallon in 1992, which is slightly changed this year and will come three days, four days after this race, this time when it used to be before it. That was a request by the organization of this event. And there, I think it's Rominger going away. He's going to take the prize at the top, at least for all of his efforts. And Berzan chasing him. Kiapucci continues to ride at the back and follow the wheels. Excellent speed from Tony Rominger. 
And Rominger has no plans to stay around for the upcoming Flesh Will On. He's now going to prepare after this event for the Tour of Spain. He's gambled everything on the victory today, which Sorensen took from him in the finish last year in a very wet Liège, Baston Liège. I'm sure many of you will have a recording of that. And you'll remember that Sorensen won so convincingly. And you might like to know, too, that Rolf Sorensen requested up one of our tapes of last year's Liège Baston Liège, which we gave him in uh, one of the classics. And it's a great souvenir for him because he always wanted to win this great race. Now the narrow roads over the top. Sharp right, general regrouping. There's no real descent off the top of Laradou for a little while. That's why if you do get dropped up the climb, you don't normally get back. And for that reason, it does appear that they've kept a very tight formation indeed on the climb. This is Giorgio Ferlau. Winner of the flesh will on. Had his best season last year. When he finished the season in second place in the Tour of Lombardy. Now, Chiapucci and Lance Armstrong. Armstrong not prepared to go with Chiapucci on the attack. Keeps on looking round. So, just a shade over 37 kilometers to go down to the finish. That's about 24 miles. And the field has regrouped again. And I can tell you the chase crew behind have collected up Moreno Argentin, containing Andre Schmil, but they're losing ground on this group completely now. So we could be looking here at the breakaway. Now, I'm sorry about this little bit of picture breakup. It's not a fault on your tape, by the way. This is the way that we're the film, we call it a microwave system, which uses the helicopter and the motorbike you can see down there sends us the signals. Occasionally, the trees cause interference from the signal, and therefore, we do get this little bit of picture breakup. But there's nothing we can do about that, but I think you'll agree these pictures generally are magnificent, that they come from our hosts at Belgian television. The field is regrouped, and judging by <laughs> we're looking down there, so too have the motorcycles. They've managed to get through on the narrow roads and move on towards the Côte des Forges, which is the next big challenge and the last real challenge before the finishing climb itself, up in the suburb of An. And there's the confirmation of that. One climb to come, the Côte des Forges. Ferland. Lance Armstrong, De La Santa. Well, Rominger started what I thought was a move so early, it was almost suicidal. Look at the gap now, two minutes, 30 seconds back to Andre Schmiel's group. Well, they can expect no help from Moreno Argentin, of course, because he still has his teammates up here. Berzan and Ferlau. Claudio dangling off the back. He hasn't done hardly any work at all in this breakaway. Being joined now by Furlout. May have been back to the team car to check out what's happened to the team captain, Argentin. Still looking quite cool and collected. You may remember a couple of years ago when Argentin won the race, he won it here by destroying the opposition on this very slope. He was going so well, he allowed them alongside him, and then he turned the screw so tight he cracked them. Well, not today. There's Giorgio's previous performances in Liège, 8th in 1992, 7th last year. He has, of course, won the flesh will on the other half of the Ardennes Classic. His big win coming in Milan San Remo this year. And Della Santa. It would be a marvelous result for him, but I think he'd be a little bit handicapped by the presence of his team leader, Rominger. He's along now to protect Rominger's place in this race. Rominger making no secret about the fact he wants to win, but you know, for me, time is ticking away for Tony Rominger. He's got one climb to come, then the climb up to Ans which is the finish is just over the top as the road flattens out a little bit. It's not the sort of finish for Rominger now in this sort of company. Rominger tried, well, he, he kept the tempo on the climb of Laradou, but he didn't accelerate sharply, which might have shaken off one or two of these riders. 
indication may be that he hasn't quite got the edge to get rid of these boys. A little bit of a message coming up for Mr. Kipuchi. Well, it won't be to ask him to sit near the back because he's been there all day. But I feel that Kiapuchi is riding a clever race. He has no teammates in this group. There are two teams represented with two men here, so why help them win the race? And uh, I feel that Lance is perhaps riding a little bit too strongly in this leading group when he doesn't need to. Rominger, checking on everybody as they go by him. There's Lance going through again. Similar erratic style to Kiapuchi. He's always in the saddle and he's out of the saddle. Keeps his rhythm high that way. And Rominger seems to be allowing one or two turns to go through. Well, maybe not. He's gone through this time. He may feel he's, he's just negotiated Lance Armstrong to be where he can see him. He may have already sensed that Armstrong is the man to beat now in this breakaway. Well, American riders have never won Liège Baston Liège. Greg LeMond had a third to Sean Kelly a few years back. That remains the best ever finish. That was back in 1984. And victory now, well, when you're world champion, that would really put Armstrong into the class of the big time bike riders of years gone by. Eddie Merckx won this race no fewer than five times. And of course, he was world champion on the occasion as well. Steady progress towards the Côte des Forges. Main road climb. And once you get to the summit, you flick left and you dive down towards Liège itself. But no longer the flat finish where the sprinters could come back into play as Sean Kelly did when he finished ahead of Phil Anderson and Greg LeMond that year in 1984. Now you go through Liège and up the back suburbs and the nasty little climb to the finish. Well, again, as a reminder of the group, three Italians, what a great season the Italians are having yet again. They go from strength to strength, and so does the sport now in Italy because of the success of their riders. Italian press and Italian spectators, very hard on the riders when they don't get the results they require. Nobody else now will get across to this group. They've gone too far ahead. And once up the Cote de Fords, they can start to think how they're going to outmaneuver each other. The one, well, I won't say strange rider, but certainly unusual to see a Russian rider in at this stage of Liège Baston Liège. I don't think it's ever happened before, but we've got Evgeny Berzan here. And one or two Americans will remember him because I remember when he was a junior rider, he rode in the Redlands Classic in the United States and he won a stage. Young Russian rider, well, he was young Soviet Union rider at the time. Now, since then, he's been the world pursuit champion, which he won in 1990 in Japan. And now, with the green light given to these Russian riders to turn professional, he's settling in as so often they are. Andrei Shmiel is another rider who's done well this year, winning Paris Roubaix just a week ago. But there's no big results yet for Berzan. He got his first time trial win as a pro this year when he won the time trial stage of the Criterium International in the south of France. It's a lovely race at the right time of the year. Temperature's around 60, 63 degrees, and it makes it feel most pleasant as the warm air comes in off the Mediterranean down there. And he finished third overall in that race as well. And he's also had uh, a small win in the tour of the Apennines road race. But this, for him, is big-time company. This is Furlan, sitting a lot at the back now. Two forty-two to Schmiel's group, four forty back to the main field. So they're out of it. Della Santa, still prepared to work hard with his team leader alongside him. and a very appreciative crowd. 
The population down in the Ardennes is very sparse indeed. You've only got the villages you pass through because there really is nothing out in the countryside, only the hills and the trees. So it's not like in the area of Flanders in Belgium where you get thousands of people watching and great enthusiasm. We're now in the French-speaking area, the Walloon area, away from the centre of Brussels. And very often the riders in Belgium, in Flanders, who come to race in this area can't even speak the language and they're still in their own country. It's a very strange experience and I've, I've come here with Belgian cyclists who have actually used their hands to explain to their own countrymen exactly what they want. Because very often the Flemish speaking riders don't speak any French at all. Cote des Fours, this is the main road climb. It's a long steady drag but it is a climb you can springboard away on if you've got the strength. Last drink for Fairland sitting there at the back of the group, but he's been for a little while now. Lance Armstrong's never, ever shirked his bit at work at the front. He's always come through. It looks as though Kipuchi's now beginning to test the riders too, getting a bit more speed out of him, roaming a right on him and watching him. You can almost feel these riders now actually planning their next move. They are just thinking what they can do now to break up what is turning out to be a six-rider compact machine. None of these riders, to me, have shown any indication of weakness. One or two have missed their turns, but it's not because they're tired, it's because they're playing their cards. They know Rominger's ambition to win this race, and there he is. Kiapucci would just love to get a result like this here. The one rider who so nearly won the Tour de France until a certain Greg Le Mans descended the Tourmalet, caught him at the bottom of Luzardidon and then wrote him off on the climb and went clear with Miguel Indurain to win the stage where he finished second Le Mans, Indurain won the stage, Le Mans won the Tour and Kiapucci had lost his chance. I think uh, basically Anybody who loves the sport would love to see Kiapucci win that great race. Now the pressure's on again and the gaps are opening. Armstrong right there, marking every move, following De La Santa through. Rominger forcing through now Berzan. Berzan allowing the speed of Armstrong, it's Kiapucci, I beg your pardon, the speed of Kiapucci there saying, well, come on. He really has found his strength now. The gap has opened at the back and it's taking a little time for them to close it down. Armstrong is just uh, below our picture here. But they're all basically together. 15 miles to go. Once they're over the Cote des Forges, the only other challenge of the day is the finish. Vice team coming up to speak to two riders in this breakaway, Guinea Berzian and Giorgio Ferlan. And Rominger again riding close formation on the steeper section of the Forge, 10% or 1 in 10, just under two miles the climb. And once more you see there's nobody seems to have the killer punch here. They're keeping the rhythm high and each rider can match this rhythm. And Rominger who's been on good form all season. He's looking forward to another Tour of Spain in which he aims to become the first rider to win that race three times. Started off well this year with his second victory in Paris Nice. A race he said he really didn't think he could win and all of a sudden in the last day he snatched it and uh, took it out. Berzan, who finished third in the Criterium International, might be worth noting that Rominger finished second in that two-day race. Kiapucci, still no sign on that face of pain, enjoying the rhythm as he climbs the Côte des Forges. Sitting at the back, fell out. A little bit of time out for him in this last few miles. Well, Armstrong should be getting increasingly confident here. He's ridden a brilliant race. He's worked hard in it. He marked the man he always wanted to mark right out at the beginning. Tony Rominger was able to go with him when he launched that terrific attack around about uh, Stoku. 
and then has never, never tired of helping this breakaway along. And if he comes to a spin, surely Armstrong is the man who's going to take it out. That would be my feeling now. And a world champion winning the age based on the age, well, that would look tremendous. At this point, the hill is beginning to level, and there is no sign whatsoever of these riders cracking, none of them. Kierpucci has set the pace on this climb, continues to do so, and when he feels good, he always does this. He looks around, he points at them, he cajoles them to come through, and Della Santa has clearly said, I'm not interested in coming by you. And Tony Rominger has got the wheel of his teammate now, Della Santa, and that's Della Santa's job to look after Rominger. There's Rominger. A little bit out of breath, but having no problems other than that. Della Santa having his best season so far, and Armstrong going round them both, taking a nice big look into the eyes of Claudio Chiapucci and taking up the pace himself. He really is confident. And I'm just wondering now why the two Mapai riders have turned off the pacemaking. If they're not going to work, I really would have expected Rominger to have launched a really strong attack to try and break up this group. He can't possibly believe that he can beat these riders in the finish, even though it's an uphill finish. I don't think he'll be strong enough to shake them. Maybe he thinks differently. If they use perhaps De La Santa as an early attack, which will force the group to chase him down, then Rominger might be able to take the rebound. But I would expect, too, that the Berzan and Furlan are planning a similar attack. Enough of it, says Chiapucci. He goes to the back and checks them all out. You can see there the chain on the big chain wheel as they come over the summit of the Cote des Forges. These riders are flying up this climb today. Now they begin to make the descent. There is a descent off this climb, which will take them down towards Liège. Well, at least the riders can't believe the luck that the weather has turned out so delightful here for this one. The 80th running, perhaps, deciding that this should be a correct way to celebrate what is notoriously a bad weather classic, as we're now inside the last 12 miles of the finish. Rominger, a strange position, Rominger. Straight arms, pushing himself back off those handlebars all of the time. Not so with Berzan, he still rides with that lovely Pursuiters style, which he won the world title back in 1990 for the old Soviet Union. Berzan is now a rider who settled nicely into this event as a pro. And Jim, Jim Okovic here, the manager of Motorola. Well, it would be nice to be a fly on the wall now because I don't really know what Jim could tell Lance other than to take it easy and plan something near the end because he's got the sprint, not to work too hard. The group behind is not coming back. So there's not a lot of point now in wasting your energy to, to tow these riders to the line and lose the finish. Schmill is still in a chasing group behind, by the way, with no further news, but it's around about 1 minute 15 seconds, so he's far from given up, and I think if he can get in there just behind this group of six, then he will keep his lead overall in the World Cup. Ferland, remember, maximum points for him in Milan-San Remo. A win today might change the standings. Berzan. Cool, calm and collected as he rides along. Twenty-three years of age, Ber Berzan comes from Viborg, but he lives in Italy now where he rides for this Italian team, Juvis. This is the descent off the Côte des Forges. Lovely, fast descent, sweeps way down. Riders should be able to do around about 50 miles an hour on these good roads on the way down. Armstrong has gone back to the front. 
just over seven miles to go. Chennai is where we are. Good to see a world champion rainbow jersey setting the pace in a great classic. This will give Lance Armstrong now great confidence for the rest of this season. Enormous pressure when you're world champion. Everybody looks at you. At the start, you're always introduced to the crowd. You're, you're expected to ride well. When you ride well, they don't say so much well done because they expect you to ride well as a world champion. But when you don't ride well, they always say, what happened? Quick drink there for Kipuchi. Oh, the weight of those rainbow jerseys, Lance. The cool face there of Giorgio Ferlin. He looks as though he's going down to the start, not near the end of Liège, Baston Liège. Very happy with the way his season's gone. All Italians want to win Milan San Remo, it's their classic. And now he's won it and had second last year in the Tour of Lombardy, so he can feel very happy about that. Now it looks as though here Kipuchi will be getting information on what is happening behind. And my information is that the group is closing in, but it's still just over a minute. But that gap has come down and Schmil is the man who's driving the charge. No more hills to hinder him. So the pressure once again now is back on this breakaway group. There we've got the four riders all behind Armstrong, two on two. Mapai Class and Jivis. And you see how they pick out their own teammates here, but Armstrong has actually split up the Mapai riders. He's got De La Santa behind him. But Ferlan and Berzin are riding together. Well, this is the calm now before the storm in the liege baston liege because they're continuing to run away from the Côte des Fours. They're still going downhill. And before you know it now, we shall run into the city of Liège, which is a beautiful city. Based on the River Mars. And then we'll cross the city and move out of town for the finish. World Championships uh, track were held nearby here back in 1975 in Rockour. Short coach ride away. In the year that Henny Kuiper, who is the assistant managing director of the Motorola team, won the world title on his own, and that was in Ivoire or Ypres, not too far away either. So we've seen the city, now we're racing towards it, and Kiapucci is on the descent. Furland has come from the back of the field to the front. Followed by his teammate as always, Berza. And we swing with all our glory into the streets of Liège now. Flat road as we make our way across the city. Romingham must be concerned by the way this race has gone. Because he's sitting at the back. He surely cannot believe he can leave them on the climb. But it's all he has left now is to attack them very strongly on the climb. And hope it works. He cannot possibly take on Lance Armstrong once over the top of the climb to the finish. It's a long way across the city, mostly on these split roads. And we have to cross the river as well. We'll choose one of the bridges and then we'll make our way up towards Anse. There's the River Mars. And it looks as though the city has turned out in small numbers here as we head up towards the finish. Rominger stalking the field. 
Fairland still looking as cool as a cucumber. And might be well feeling that his time has come to win another classic. This is the clearest classic he's ridden, in fact, since he won Milan San Remo. He didn't ride Tour de Flanders, he didn't ride Paris Roubaix. Rominger is in a similar situation and said he wants to win at Liege Baston Liege. Where's number 11, by the way, which uh, you might like to know was the same number that Stephen Roach wore in the year he won the 1987 Tour de France. What a fine sight that makes as we have to go high in the helicopter to clear the city here. Well, the group Schmiel has dropped back dramatically since we came up the Côte des Forges. In fact, on the Côte des Forges, Schmiel clearly couldn't keep the pace up. He was coming back, but he's gone right back now, almost four minutes. They've kept the pressure on down the other side. And it looks to me now as though they certainly have no further competition from the rear, but Rominger has plenty of competition here in this leading group. And there's one of them, the white jersey of the world champion, Lance Armstrong of the United States. Well, while Tony Rominger moves across to try and concentrate on winning the Tour of Spain for the third time, very shortly, Armstrong will be going back stateside to try and win the Tour DuPont for the first time leading the Motorola in that event. And again, Armstrong was selected to follow the wheel of Rominger. He still sees this man as the rider to beat. He followed him when he broke away, and now he's going to follow him in case he tries it again on the last climb. And I think Lance has realized that Rominger must attack on that last climb, and if he does, we can expect to see Armstrong go with him again. He must be very happy with the return to form here, Lance. He's been away, getting in some valuable training. There were those who said he was overtrained for the beginning of the season, but I always feel that overtraining is a state of the mind, and Lance seems to have straightened that out now. Still looking for a classic victory, Lance Armstrong. He started so well when he turned pro at the end of 1992. The Olympic year in which he really did flop in the Olympic Games, but he came out fighting as a young pro when he finished second in the championship of Zurich. And then last year, third overall in the Tour of Sweden, second in the Tour DuPont. And we'll always remember the million dollar prize he won by winning three races in the United States, which everybody thought could not be done. American champion. World champion, stage of the Tour de France, Lance Armstrong has really accomplished an awful lot in one and a half seasons as a professional. This will be a natural extension of his honours list if he could win at the Liège Baston Liège. It's a classic that so many want to win. La Doyenne is what its name is in French the leader of them all. The roads begin to narrow now. We head up towards the finishing area. I think it's an excellent finish that the organization now, which has been taken over by the Society of the Tour de France, so the same organization that organized the Tour de France, now puts on this with the basic organization of the Velo Club Liegeoise and it has greatly improved. There were a couple of years ago the riders felt this race was becoming too dangerous to ride. You probably remember the terrible crash of Davis Finney when he rammed into the back of a team car and badly cut his face. Laurent Fignon also went down very badly and said the race was now too dangerous to continue. Well the arrival of the Societe de Tour... Oh well Rominger's hand's gone up! Rominger has a puncture! Tony Rominger has a puncture just at the moment. He must have been planning the attack, and can you believe that? Rominger is dropping out at the very foot of the climb. Well, what a cruel stroke of luck. The bike, and it's going to be a bike change, I think, straight away as the team cars flood by. And Rominger had to be pinning every bit of his hopes on this climb. And now there are five riders left in Liège-Baston-Liège. 
Well, sometimes you have to say this is such a cruel sport. And Tony Rominger has lost any chance at all of victory now. He built all of his early season around this race. And now the climb begins towards the finishing line with Claudio Chiapucci setting the pace. The others will have seen him go. They'll have wondered where he was for a moment. He's back and riding again. New bike indeed. No number on the frame of this one. But his legs are going to scream now as he tries to get back up to that group. Well, he's no time to think about luck in this race. He's got to get going. He's got six and a half kilometres to go to the finish. He's still got time, but will he arrive back up with this front group with anything like the strength required to ride away from them? There's the tail of the convoy. Rominger trying to come back. Such bad, bad luck for Tony Rominger. And in fact, there's no real attack. Well, I was about to say there's no real attack, but that's Berzan gone. Berzan has gone from the back, a classic move from the rear, and Furlan at the front won't chase him down. So the two Javis boys topped and tailed the breakaway. Armstrong has looked around for a reaction. There isn't any. Now there is. Kierpucci's gone. Kierpucci's gone, but Berzan shot out the blocks from the back of that group. He waited till his teammate had the lead. He attacked from the back so his teammate would not react. And they've gone. Well, what an amazing set of circumstance here as we came into the closing kilometres of Liège, Baston Liège. First of all, Tony Rominger punctures and compromises the Mapai class team because really De La Santa was here for Rominger. And then Berzan sits at the back until he sees his teammate at the front and goes. It was a split second delay, but Berzan now has settled down into the sort of position that once won him the World Pursuit Championship in, in Japan in 1990, the first time the World Championships were ever held there. And a little bit of surprise now because, in fact, Armstrong here, who must have been planning on a sprint victory, is now compromised. The American has Furlan here, who will not react at all because if you bring back Berzan, Furlan will go for sure. And still no sign of the arrival of Tony Rominger, so they must keep the press the pressure on here. And there's only two men left to work, and that's Kierpucci and Armstrong. And just look at the speed now of Evgeny Berzan. He's never won a classic race in his life. He turned pro in 1993. He now lives in Bronny in Italy. He comes from the north of Russia, up by the Finnish borders in Vyborg. And he's gone. What a superb piece of riding by the Javais team. Furlan might feel a little bit compromised as well because I'm sure he came here to win this race, but he's not going to damage the attack of his young new teammate. And he's got through the barrier now, the pain that you always get when you launch the initial attack, and he's settling down into a rhythm. And this is a fine piece of riding now. He first uh, was seen over here when he won a stage of the Redlands Classic Stage Race, which was won this year, by the way, by Malcolm Elliott for the second year running, I believe. But Berzan now has much bigger fish to fry. We're on the climb to the finish. First big stage race last year, the Tour of Italy, the Giro d'Italia. He finished 90th. And then he came across to Great Britain when I saw him ride. He finished 23rd in the Kellogg's Tour of Britain race. But what a season he's having so far. He said all along his big win is coming. He can feel it in his legs. Well, they're in his legs now, and his big win could be just over the top of this hill. He finished second in the Tour of the Mediterranean, second in Terreno Adriatico, third in the Criterium International, where he won the time trial stage, small win in the Tour of the Apennines, third in the Sicilian week, and now is he going to be first in Liège, Baston Liège for him? 23 seconds already. The gap, I think, already too much for these riders. And still, sadly, dangling off the back of that group is Rominger. He can't close it down. The Belgian flags fly, but it should really be the Russian flag that flies now. Because the Russian riders, the former ex-Soviet riders, are now beginning to make inroads into the big world of pro cycling. We saw Andre Schmil a week ago in Paris-Roubaix bounce and slither and slide in tremendously difficult conditions to win that and take the lead in the World Cup competition. Shamili's still on the attack, not far off our picture, around about a minute behind. 
Still should keep his lead in the World Cup, but can't get up here. Rominga is in desperate trouble. The arrival is just three kilometres away. Keir Pucci, who at one stage looked good for victory, is now having to do all of the work along with Armstrong. There's no, uh, no more help. Armstrong at the back of these four riders must be feeling desperately disappointed. All that Armstrong can hope for now is to finish off second place in the sprint as we go along from the helicopter. The long, empty road. What speed this man has. He tore away from that group. Well, my goodness me, he's gone. Those cars are even in the gap now. It's over 30 seconds. Oh, well, there you are. 32 seconds is the gap. And he's still looking for more. The best till the last. He never appeared in trouble. He was in the breakaway as soon as he saw Rominger attack way off the field at the beginning, out of Stoku. And he's gone. We're being treated here to another triumph from an ex-Soviet rider. The young Russian has a great career ahead of him as well. He's just 23 years of age. He'll be 24 in June of this year. When he might well be riding the Tour of Italy. He looks over his shoulder, but he really shouldn't be too worried now because he has the comfort of the following cars and he knows exactly what that means. It means he's got at least 30 seconds. Just rocking and rolling that machine with a beautiful rhythm. Head up. Eyes penetrating the centre of his extension. And now these riders are soon going to say, well, he's gone and they've got to think only of second place. They know that Roming is coming back, but he obviously can't get back. Ferlan in theory, is now in charge here. 45 seconds, the gap is up to. He is absolutely flying. Tremendous ride by Berzam. Well, the classics this year have been a superb set of races. We've seen the gaps open and close. We've seen some marvellous attacking riding. Armstrong just checking out there to see exactly where Rominger is. And I don't know if you can see him or not, but we're inside two kilometres to go. So we're not far away from the one mile to go. And very shortly, Berzam is going to see for the first time the flam rouge, the red flame in the sky, the flag, which will tell him he's a kilometre from his greatest moment. And he's being drawn there now as if he's got a magnet on his nose. He refuses to let those rhythms drop down. Whenever he senses he's losing his rhythm, he jumps out of the saddle and pushes it back up. Those beautifully bronze legs from racing in the Italian area in the early spring. I think if they'd been racing in Belgium, we'd probably say they were caused by rain and therefore it was rust, but it's not. Fifty-nine seconds. He's almost got a full minute on the field. He broke at the start of the finishing climb. Quite clearly, it's not a case of them letting this gap open. They can do nothing about it. He saved the best to the last. He's absolutely stoked up with energy. He's also riding on a big slice of adrenaline now. He's riding what it looks to be his biggest gear as well as we drop away slowly towards the finishing line. And this is why I feel, although Rominger might say differently, he could never have won this race with the company he had, even though he has punctured and lost his chance. We will never know the answer to that now. But you have this long drop over the top, which still gives it back to the sprinters if they can survive on the climb. And they've slowed down dramatically now. Kipuchi, not the greatest sprinter in the world, is going to have to share the box with Lance Armstrong or Furlan, who must be feeling a little bit fresh. Berzan prepares for the finish now. Yes, take a good look, Evgeny, but you will see nobody. This is your first big classic win and he's going to make the most of it. He gets 50 points as well. It's going to bring him right up overall in the World Cup competition. That's not his prime objective. His prime objective was to win his first ever classic race and really only his second noted road racing win as a pro. He's in the finish house as victor in the 80th Liège-Bastogne-Liège. More importantly for him, the first ever Russian rider to do it. And just look at the gap. We're going back something like a minute and 15 seconds to this group on the road. Fairland, 
Kipuchi on the far side. Armstrong now knows he's got to finish this off with a good sprint to get second. And that would be a best ever US result anyway. And it will be a world championship finish as well. And Kipuchi might well be left to open up this. De La Santa is not a fast finisher to my knowledge. Furlan might be the rider to beat. I don't think uh, we need worry about Kiapucci. He might well start the running. But I'll be very concerned about Furlan. He's been the passenger now for the last six kilometres, doing his job as a teammate for Berzan, who's now toweling himself down and getting ready to go on the winner's podium. He's not going to believe it. He's not going to wake up tomorrow morning and believe he's just won this race either. There's the long, long finishing straight. And, the, and in fact, it started early. And it's De La Santa who's gone. So the non-sprinter opens it up. Armstrong's got the best position at the back, but he won't have to stay there too long. If they fan out, they might block him. Furlan's the rider on Armstrong's wheel. That will be liked by Armstrong, who tries to come through. Now he follows Furlan's wheel. Furlan goes for the line. Armstrong kicks. And it's going to be a formality for Armstrong. He gets second place. A great finish indeed by Lance Armstrong. Furlan is third. Then comes Kiapucci fourth. De La Santa is fifth. And there, as we look back down the road, is the lonely figure of Tony Rominger who may well say he was going to win but for the puncture I don't think he would have done because he should have won this race much earlier on but even so he would have been a very very high finish indeed as it is the puncture has robbed him he comes home a very very disappointed sixth place in this year's Liège Bastogne Liège and he was second a year ago and his face tells us that story so, Tony Rominger is home in sixth place. There is the result of a breakaway that tore the 80th Liège Baston Liège apart and left the World Cup holder Andre Schmiel still in the lead in the World Cup but having to be content with a finish off the back of the breakaway. And there is the happiest man today in Belgium as he waves to the crowd, Evgeny Berzan of Russia, the first Russian rider ever to win Liège-Bastogne-Liège and he won the best one of them all, the 80th edition 